Uh, so my name is Jim Reekin. Um, I'm a senior developer at Hootsuite in Vancouver. I work on our platform team. Um, we're responsible for our microservices architecture and um, a lot of our backend services and infrastructure that powers the, our application. Um, Hootsuite is one of the most widely used platforms for managing social media. Uh, it's used by over 10 million people across the world. Um, we have a web-based uh, dashboard product as well as some mobile apps. And you can send messages, schedule messages, uh, see messages and interact with them. Uh, for the past couple of years, we've been working on transitioning from a massive PHP application to a set of uh, Scala-based microservices to help us scale our application and our organization. Um, so today, uh, I want to talk about a bit about the transition from a monolithic application to a distributed system of microservices and some of the ways that complexity and sources of failure can be introduced when that happens. I also want to talk about asynchronous messaging, um, in specific publish subscribe pattern and how it can help reduce some of that pain. I want to show how Kafka, which is an asynchronous pub sub messaging system, um, is a great foundation to do that. And finally, I'll talk about reactive streams and active streams um, and how they can be used to easily work with Kafka in your Scala code. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, about how to set up a Kafka cluster um, or give an in-depth tutorial on active streams. I want to start off by showing some of the types of complexity and sources of errors that uh, are often encountered when breaking up a monolith into a set of small microservices. So most applications start off as a monolith. Um, what do I mean by a monolith? So it's usually a single code base that the entire development team works on. There's usually a single source of truth or a single database um, and a single deploy process. Sort of one build pipeline, one places where changes uh, are waiting to be deployed. This is usually great for a small team. Um, there's not a lot of moving parts. It's really easy to iterate and make atomic changes to the entire code base. If you want to change an API, you can just search and find all the usages of it. Um, and everything's a local method call away uh, or a call to a central database. Um, everything sort of stays in sync really easily. Uh, however, a lot of the benefits of monoliths become drawbacks as the size of the development team increases and the application becomes larger and larger. Um, the efficiency sort of drops off after that initial spike. Um, as the application gets larger and larger, the build times get longer and longer, tests take longer and longer, and one developer can break the build and cause the entire team to have to wait. There also needs to be more coordination between development teams to ensure that the application can always be deployed. For example, some teams may need to wait until others, others finish their uh, functionality before they can actually deploy their code. Uh, things like feature flagging can help with this, but um, if you get a lot of flags, it can become really complicated. Also, the entire application needs to be scaled up because of a small, highly used feature. Um, often can take a lot more resources and money. Um, it can also be hard or impossible to try out new technologies or new data stores because your application is this sort of mono, monolith. Um, one obvious solution is to sort of start pulling independent small services out of the monolith. You sort of decrease the size of the monolith um, and you allow the teams to work separately from each other and communicating over API contracts. Eventually, you get enough services pulled out that the monolith is kind of gone. It sort of becomes a facade where it just calls the backend services and aggregates the data that the client needs. And by microservices, I mean a small service that has, has an independent code base. Um, it's deployed independently of the others. Um, it owns its own data. It kind of only does one thing. Um, and it's owned by a single small team that's empowered to make changes whenever they need to to the application. And it communicates with the other services via well-defined APIs. It could be REST over HTTP, could be Thrift, could be gRPC. Microservices come with a lot of benefits. Um, since they're small and encapsulate one thing, the build times are short, the test times are short. Each service can be deployed and scaled independently of the other services. Um, it can save a lot of money as compared to with the monolith. Each service can use whatever technology is appropriate for it. For example, an analytics service might have a lot different data requirements than a user management service. Uh, it's also easy to create new services because they're small. Um, it can help spur innovation in the organization. Uh, also, each service has a clear owner um, who's responsible for all aspects of the service. Um, with a monolith, there's not often clear owners, and you can sort of sometimes get one person that gets overburdened with um, all that work. Um, microservices aren't a civil bullet, though. Um, with the introduction of services, the application now becomes a distributed system. Um, you have network calls everywhere. Um, 
you get latency. All the calls between services are remote, uh, which adds additional latency. Um, there's a lot higher chance of failure. So any service or network component can fail at any time. The system has to be architected with this in mind. And the failure of a downstream component, say this very last box, um, can cause cascading failure to cause failure all the way up to the top level. Um, also, the uptime of the entire service now becomes the combined uptime of all the services in the critical path. For example, say you have four services that each have 99.9% .9 uptime, which is pretty good. Um, the overall uptime of this ch whole chain is only 99.5%, which is not that good. It's sort of the difference between like half an hour of downtime versus three and a half hours of downtime in a month. Uh, you also need a lot more coordination. Since there's no longer a single source of truth, um, it becomes necessary for coordination between these services. Uh, for example, when a user is deleted from the system, um, you might need to clean up all their information. You don't really want to be doing this synchronously or having the user management system need to know about every other part of the application. You also need more coordination between teams. Um, Cross-cutting changes can't be made atomically anymore. Um, API changes need to be carefully designed so that they are backwards compatible or the API needs to be versioned and it can slow down the speed of changes. And if you're not careful, the overall system can end up tightly coupled and starting to look like spaghetti and having each request pass through tons and tons of other services, similar to how the monolith can sort of become all tangled together. Um, but usually not all these calls necessarily need to be part of the uh, critical path to complete the user's operation. For example, like deleting a user, you don't really need to delete all their data synchronously. Also sending a message to a social network, it doesn't really need to archive the message or perform any analytics on it. So a good way to reduce the complexity and uh, lower the chance of failure of the overall request is sort of by pulling out all the non-essential API calls from being synchronous and blocking, or synchronous and non-blocking, uh, for the request to be asynchronous. So if there's fewer paths, fewer calls in the path, it becomes more reliable. Rather than having everything being done over API calls, um, we can simply send the messages to an asynchronous message bus. Um, service can fire and forget a message into the bus. Any number of other services can uh, consume this information at their own pace outside of the scope of the user request. Um, so obvious stability reasons aside, why would you want to do this? Um, it has decoupling. It completely decouples the producers from the consumers of the information. For example, the service that needs to process tweets from the Twitter fire hose doesn't really need to know about the analytics system or a push notification system. Uh, the point-to-point -point messaging becomes publish subscribe. One-to-one -one becomes one-to-many. Um, there's less coordination. Uh, aside from agreeing on the message format, there's little to no coordination that has to happen uh, between a producer of information and a consumer of it. Um, once something's producing data to the message bus, adding additional consumers to that information doesn't affect the producing service at all, so it's really easy. Um, it can also help scale your organization, um, as there's less back and forth necessary between teams. A team doesn't even need to know who's consuming their messages as long as they're publishing sort of the format of the message. Um, so what kind of requirements would we want in an asynchronous messaging solution? Um, it needs to have well-defined delivery semantics. For example, it needs to know if it's at least once or at most once or exactly once because with at least once you have to deal with duplicates. Um, with at most once or with, with at most once you have to deal with lost messages and exactly once is really hard to do. You want it to be high throughput. Um, we don't want uh, to block colors. We want the messages to send fast. We want it to be highly available. We don't want a, a part of the messaging system that breaks to stop it from working. We also want to have durability. We don't want a failure of part of the system or the entire system to cause data loss. Uh, we want it to be scalable. Um, we want to be able to grow the capacity of the system over time. And really important, we want back pressure. We want to be able to have a slow consumer to be able to handle data coming from a fast producer. Um, there's a lot of different messaging systems out there, and uh, the one that I found is really good. It's called Kafka. Um, so what is Kafka? Um, some of you may have heard of it before or used it. Um, it's a distributed, partitioned, replicated commit log service. Um, that's a lot of words. <laughs> um, but sort of by commit log, think of how a database works um, with its uh, write-ahead log. Uh, it's append only. It's a linear reads and writes, um, which is really fast. Uh, it, has pub sub messaging functionality, um, one to many messaging. It was created by LinkedIn, uh, but now it's a top level Apache open source project and it has a, a company that manages it. I think it's called Confluent. So a Kafka cluster maintains feeds of messages called topics. Um, entities that send messages into topics are called producers. 
and the entities that read the messages are called consumers. Kafka topics are sort of a logical grouping of one or more individual commit logs called partitions. For example, this topic has three partitions. Um, each partition is an ordered immutable sequence of messages. Um, this means that if the topic has many partitions, there's no uh, total order of the messages. There's only an order per partition. The messages are continually added to the end of the log, and each message has a numeric position or offset. Uh, the messages are persisted in the log for a configured amount of time, whether they've been consumed or not. Uh, typical retention periods are usually around an hour to a week, um, depending on the volume of data. I think the Kafka default is two weeks. Uh, we use this at Hootsuite for two weeks, except for a few situations where we've lowered the retention to be smaller because we have a very high volume topic. And usually you start with just a few partitions and then you can add them as more parallelism is necessary. Producers, as their name implies, send messages to partitions and topics. Uh, they're responsible for, for choosing which partition to send the message to. So there's a couple different strategies you can choose. Um, messages can be round robin over all the partitions, which sort of puts an even amount of load on each partition, which is kind of fair. The producer can also consistently hash the messages based on a message key you provide. And this ensures that as long as a message has the same key, it'll always go to the same partition. So you can't, if you can't get a total order over the whole topic, you can at least get an order for the individual message, the individual keys. But this can cause an unbalance of messages sometimes if one message key is busier than the other. Say you have a really, really popular user on your uh, system, its messages will always get hashed to the same partition. So consumers, um, as opposed to many other messaging systems, uh, Kafka consumers pull data from the partitions of a topic. It's not pushed to them. And all they track is their position in each uh, partition. This makes them extremely cheap. They just have to store a couple numbers. Consumers are tagged with a group ID, uh, which groups all consumers with the same ID into a logical group. And each partition is assigned to only one consumer in a consumer group. So if all consumers have the same group ID, you sort of get a queuing message model where the message will be, sort of be round robin between all the uh, entities. If they all have different group IDs, you sort of get a pub sub like topics where everything gets all the messages. The number of partitions in a topic should be more large enough so that there are at least as many um, top partitions as there are consumers in the group. Otherwise, some consumers will be sitting there doing nothing until one of the other consumers stops. So for example, in group two here, consumer six is doing nothing because there's four consumers in that group, but only three partitions. But for example, if consumer three died, consumer six would get assigned the the partition that it had. At Hootsuite, we typically have a single consumer group per service, and then we scale up and down the service, knowing that each message will only be delivered once um, by one of the server uh, workers in that group. Uh, so now that I've sort of described the main components of Kafka, does it meet those requirements that um, I talked about a bit earlier for our uh, good messaging system? Um, Kafka is really fast. Um, it can handle hundreds of megabytes per second of reads and writes um, over thousands of concurrent clients. Um, it uses immutable log files, so it's like an O1 operation to append it. It also uses um, the send file system call, which lets it send data directly from the operating system page cache to the network card. It never actually goes into the application memory. Um, and it uses the same data structures for in-memory and on disk, so that's really efficient. Uh, so at the high end, LinkedIn published a blog post uh, last year where they said they send 800 billion messages per day. Um, and 100, like 18 million messages per second at peak, um, and 175 terabytes of data per day over 1,000 servers, so it scales really well. At Hootsuite, we push hundreds of gigabytes per day, so we're not really at that scale yet. Um, Kafka deals really well with failure of its components. Um, for the brokers, um, all messages are persisted on disk, so if a broker crashes, it just comes back up with no loss of data, and it sort of syncs with the other brokers with what it missed. The partitions of a topic are replicated across the cluster. Um, the number of replicas that a topic has is configurable, but it should usually always be at least two. If the broker crashes, um, one of the other nodes will take over as a leader for the partition, and sort of the producers and consumers will switch over to using that new server automatically. For the consumers, if they stop working, they just start where they stopped off because they store that position in the log. Um, if the consumer is part of a group, the partitions that it had will get reassigned to another consumer in the group that's still alive. And producers, um, producers can be configured to retry um, on failure. 
Um, and this changes it to, to sort of an at least once messaging semantics where it's sending duplicates, but you get, you make sure the message gets sent. Uh, at Hootsuite, we've had brokers fail with zero effect on the producers and consumers. The producers sometimes have to retry sending a message, but the consumers just basically change to use the new uh, broker that takes, takes charge of the topics. This is also really good when we deploy new code because the rolling restarts of a consumer results in no lost messages because the consumers sort of just start where they left off when they restart. Um, it's really easy to scale Kafka. Um, you can see in those numbers from LinkedIn, um, it scales to very large sizes. Additional capacity can be added to the cluster of runtime with zero downtime. Um, you just need to add more servers and then you can assign partitions onto those new servers with a t command line tool. And effectively adding more servers just adds more disk space to the cluster. And since partitions can be stored, um, topic or stored on different servers, the size of a single topic can actually be larger than any single server can hold, which is kind of nice. And you can add more partitions at runtime to get more parallelism. Say you have more consumers, you can just add more partitions um, and they'll be able to consume. Um, Kafka also helps introduce back pressure into your system. Uh, disk is really cheap, so it can allow an un almost unlimited data sync for messages. Um, the per topic retention period sort of acts as a service level agreement for the consumers. The consumer has to pull the messages within that period of time to avoid losing anything. But if, if it does during that period of time, it won't lose anything. This way it's sort of almost impossible for a fast producer to overload a slow consumer. And this helps enable the creation of real time as well as batch processing uh, that works effectively. So you could have a process that runs once a day that just gets all the messages that happen during that day as long as the retention period on the topic is longer than that. Um, I want to make a quick aside about the data format of messages that you would send into Kafka. Um, sort of in order for different parts of your system to take full advantage of the message bus, they need to know what is in the message um, and be able to sort of react to changes in the message without exploding. Uh, Kafka only deals with byte arrays um, in its data format. Um, the messages are byte arrays, the keys are byte arrays. You need to choose a message format that can be understood by both producers and consumers. It's even more important if you're sort of in a polyglot environment where you're dealing with multiple languages, um, where messages produced in one language need to be consumed by consumers in another language. So there are a few options. Um, sort of a naive option would be to use uh, serialization. Um, but serialization has a lot of issues with it, um, including being ridiculously easy to create backwards in incompatible changes. Even minor language versions introduce uh, non-binary compatible changes. You can use a text format like JSON, um, which is a good choice. Um, everything in the universe can read and write JSON um, without too much effort. Um, the only issue is that it's kind of large and relatively slow to parse compared to a binary format. Uh, at Hootsuite, we found the best format for us is to use a protocol buffers, uh, which are a binary data format that was developed at Google. It's really fast at serializing and deserializing data. Um, it uses an interface description language um, to describe the message format, which you can then compile into uh, code that runs in uh, many languages. It's also easy to make backwards compatible changes um, if you follow just a few simple rules that they outline um, on their documentation. There's one caveat with the protocol buffers though, is that they're untyped when they're serialized. So you need to sort of pass type information along with your messages so that the consumers know which protobuf to use to deserialize it. In our case, we sort of associate a UUID with each message type, append that UUID to our messages, and then use a mapping that we generate in our uh, source code that maps between the two and lets us automatically deserialize the messages. So I wanna switch gears a little bit now. Um, so far I've talked about the problems that can arise with migration from monoliths to microservices and sort of how a message bus in Kafka in specific can help with that at sort of the macro level. Now I wanna sort of focus more on the micro level actually interacting with streams of data from Kafka. And if you're not careful, code within your single service can come, become complicated and prone to unbounded memory usage when dealing with streaming data. So I wanna talk about reactive streams, ACA streams, and how they can be used to simply and safely uh, interact with Kafka. So Reactive Streams is an, an initiative, initiative for providing standard um, asynchronous stream processing with non-blocking back pressure. And that non-blocking back pressure is really key. 
Uh, many stream processing systems don't allow a consumer to push back on a producer that's producing too quickly for it to keep up. Reactive streams have an explicit mechanism for subscribers to signal demand to publishers. And the publisher will not send more data than is demanded. But reactive streams is fairly low level and meant for library authors uh, to use for implementing more developer-friendly developer APIs. Uh, this is basically ent the entire reactive streams API. It's three, three classes. There's subs subscribers um, that can subscribe to publishers um, who then send them a subscription um, that they can use to request uh, messages from the publisher. The publisher calls on next um, every time there's a piece of data. It can call, call, call that indefinitely if the stream is um, infinite. Then it calls on complete when it's finished or on, fail, on error if it actually failed at some point. The subscriber can uh, use the subscription to request data. Um, as you can see, this it's really low level. Um, using it on its own would be kind of painful. Um, so instead, I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about ACA streams, um, which is interoperable with the Reactive Streams API, um, and it uses it internally. But it uses ACA actors and a nice API on top of that to implement the stream processing. Um, as I said, ACA streams is a library built on top of ACA actors and Reactive Streams, and it provides a way to process sequences of elements using bounded buffer space. So this is different than the typical actor model that you have with ACA, which often processes using unbounded buffers that can explode your heap, or it allows bounded buffers but will drop messages. ACA streams doesn't allow buffers to grow unbounded, and it doesn't drop messages. Also, unlike plain actors, uh, ACA, streams is strong, ACA streams are strongly typed, um, so you don't have to deal with receive block that takes the universe and returns nothing. Uh, ACA streams have some core concepts that are used to construct topologies for stream processing. There's a source, which is a processing stage with exactly one output and no inputs that emits elements downstream um, when they're ready. There's a sync, which is the opposite. It's a processing stage with exactly one input. It accepts elements from upstream and may influence back pressure on the upstream so it can say, I'm busy, stop sending me things. Then there's a flow, which is the combination of both of them. Um, it has exactly one input, one output, and it sort of uh, it just transforms data and propagates back pressure up. If it gets back pressure from its output, it sends it up to the input. There are also some junction stages that, the, that do fan out and fan in. Um, for fan out, think of something like broadcasting or round robin, and for fan in, think of like merging or concatenating streams. Once a stream topology has no exposed outputs or inputs, it's what's called a runnable graph and can actually be run and do things. Um, processing stages are immutable. They can be reused and composed together just like functions. So anything that has the shape of a source is a source. Anything that has the shape of a sink is a sink. And anything that has the shape of a flow is a flow, no matter how complicated it is inside. So it's really nice for building um, abstractions around complicated stream processing and still have a simple building block. It's sort of simple to have, similar to how in ACA you have the props object, which is an immutable print for, blueprint for constructing the actual actor instances. Um, so when act, uh, the actual graph is run, it's materialized, and sort of this is analogous to turning on the tap in a real pipeline and seeing the water start flowing through. Um, actors will be created to handle the processing stages. Um, files or sockets or other resources can be opened, or connections to Kafka in our case. And when the stream completes, these resources will be uh, released automatically. Um, each graph stage can optionally provide a value once it's materialized that can help you interact with other parts of your system that aren't necessarily using ACA streams. For example, uh, a source can materialize to an actor that when sent messages will emit them downstream into the stream, or a promise that once completed will uh, emit that item downstream and then complete the stream. Or it can also uh, interop, for, interop with a uh, reactive stream subscriber. It can also materialize to no value. And similarly, syncs can materialize to an actor that upstream messages will be sent to. And this actor can actually influence back pressure on the rest of the stream. Or it can be a future that contains a computed result, assuming that the stream completes. 
And this is kind of nice. You can uh, you could hide the fact that you're using ACA streams from an API consumer. You could have an API that returns a future. And then inside that API method, you can actually create a crazy stream topology and run it and just return that simple future result to your consumer. Um, also, it can be a reactive streams producer, which allows interoperability. You might be thinking active streams looks great, um, but can I easily hook it up with Kafka? Um, and yes, there's a library called Reactive Kafka that does this. Um, it's an active streams wrapper around the Kafka 0.9 Java API. Um, it's under a little bit of uh, flux in development right now. It was originally written, I think, by SoftwareML, but it's moved to be an ACA project now. Um, and it provides Kafka consumer source and a uh, Kafka producer sync. It might seem kind of backwards having a consumer be a source and a producer being a sync, but it kind of makes sense once you think about it a bit. Um, the consumer is pulling messages from Kafka and then emitting them into the stream. Um, and the, pro the producer is receiving messages from the stream and then sending them to Kafka. So the reactive Kafka producer is a sync that can send messages to Kafka topics. Um, it can also be a flow that emits a message to Kafka and then emits a message downstream when the message is successfully produced to Kafka. And this is kind of useful for logging when a message sends properly or doing some other processing once that happens. Another nice thing is that the Kafka connections are automatically managed. Um, when the sync is connected, the Kafka connection will be made. And when the stream completes, the connection to Kafka will be automatically closed. Uh, similarly, the reactive Kafka consumer is a source that pulls messages from one or more Kafka topics and emits them downstream. It's able to auto-commit messages, um, which provides an at most once uh, message semantics, um, or it can also pass an offset object down through the stream that can then be used later um, to actually commit that offset back to Kafka and say, I've consumed this message after the message had, the processing has completed. And this sort of gives the at least once consumption semantics. So you can choose depending on how your application works. It receives back pressure from downstream. Um, so if it receives that back pressure, it just simply stops consuming from Kafka. That's the nice thing about Kafka is it's a pull base. If you don't want more messages, you just don't pull them. Also, when the stream is run, it materializes into a control object that can be used to stop the consumer and finish the stream. And like the producer, all the Kafka resources are automatically managed. Um, when the stream starts, it connects to Kafka. When the control object's used to stop the stream, it disconnects from Kafka. Uh, so this is what uh, a pro simple producer example would look like. Um, you need an actor system and an actor materializer, and that's what ACA uses to actually construct the actors and do all sorts of magic when it actually runs your stream. Uh, you need producer settings. So here we're using a, a key that's a byte array, a body for the message that's a string, and telling it to send it to the Kafka server running on localhost. Uh, finally, we create a source that's emitting the numbers 1 to 100. We're mapping it and changing it into a string that just says message 1, message 2. Then we create this producer record, um, which is a Kafka data structure that says, um, I'm sending a message that has a key of a byte array, a body of string. I'm sending it to the topic called lower and I'm just sending the message, I'm not giving it a key. And then we're saying, uh, send it to a producer, uh, a plain sync, and this is a sync that just sends messages to Kafka with those producer settings, and then when you run it, it will take those messages from one to 100 and send them to Kafka and then close the connection to Kafka. Uh, similarly, the consumer, you need the same actor system and materializer. The consumer settings are similar. Um, in this case, you have a deserializer instead of serializer. Um, we're also telling it the set of topics to listen to. In this case, we're listening to a set called lower. We're telling it which Kafka server to connect to. And then we're telling it a consumer group ID, which I talked about earlier, which allows you to have a logical set of consumers. Um, here, we're creating an at most once source, which is automatically committing the offsets once it gets messages. We're grabbing the value out of the record. And then we're just sending it to a sync that just prints out the value. So this will basically listen to Kafka and print out values from the messages it gets and run it. And that gives this control object. And then later on, whenever we're in our application, we can call stop on it, which will stop consuming and complete the stream. You can also combine the two. Um, I omitted the boilerplate on this one. Um, but here we're using a, a different kind of source, a committable source. 
um, which passes an offset object down the stream that can be used later to commit the offset. Um, then we sort of are taking the value, making it uppercase, constructing that same producer record, um, sending it to a different topic this time called upper. Um, and then we're passing that committable offset around. That's what comes from the committable source. Um, and that's sent downstream to this committable sync. And so what happens here is the producer produces the message and only once it's successfully produced the message will it actually commit that offset back to Kafka and say, I'm done producing this message. Um, so that's really nice. Um, if you fail in the middle, it'll just, uh, when you reconnect, it'll start reading the messages from where it left off, reprocess them, and eventually commit. So what does this give us? In about five or six lines of code, um, we have at least once delivery. We have full back pressure in here. If for some reason committing, uh, sending to Kafka becomes slow, it'll stop uh, consuming messages from the other topic. Um, and it's pretty easy to read. We did a bunch of stuff here. We connected to a Kafka topic, we transformed the data, and we sent it to another topic just in a few lines of code. Um, it's a super simple example, but it illustrates how easy it is to process data from Kafka with ACA streams. So now I'm gonna tempt the demo gods and try to show you this um, running. So on my laptop, I'm running a Kafka broker. Um, I have two topics called lower and upper. And I'm running that, I'm gonna run that example from the last couple of slides where it consumes from one topic, uppercases the value, and produces it to the other topic. Um, let's see, I'll start the consumers. This is, this is consuming off the lowercase topic, so we'll see the messages initially come in here, lowercase, and this is consuming from the uppercase topic where it will show the messages um, as they're processed by uh, ACA streams and uppercase. So I'm gonna use Ammonite, which is a REPL that is a little bit nicer than the built-in Scala REPL. It has uh, syntax highlighting and some other nice stuff. You can load libraries from IV. So here I'm loading uh, ACA actor, ACA streams, and then uh, reactive Kafka. Now I'm gonna load just some imports that we need from all the libraries. It's sort of importing the Scala DSL from ACA streams and, Kaf and uh, reactive Kafka. Now I'm gonna uh, create the actor system and the materializer. Create the producer settings that we had before in the slides. Connecting to the broker running on my computer and the consumer settings. I'm gonna tell it to listen to the topic called lower and uh, connect to my local Kafka instance and give it the group ID service one. Now I'm gonna actually create the consumer and start it. So here you can see, uh, it's basically the code from the slide. I'm returning that control object after running the uh, stream here. So this is actually connecting to Kafka. Um, now I have that control object that I can use later to stop. Now I'm gonna produce some messages. I'm gonna add an evil thread.sleep in here so that I can quickly move to the other uh, screen. So here I'm just gonna Emit from one to 100, emit message one to 100 to the lower topic. Um, so let's hope this works. So this will send it. So we should see on the left-hand side, the messages come in on the lower topic, and then they'll start being processed immediately on the other side to be uppercased. And so that happened pretty quickly. Um, and we can do it again. I'm gonna show you what happens when you, uh, if I stop the consumer. So it's not running anymore. So what happens if I produce some more messages? So I just produced a bunch of messages. You can see them. Here, I'm gonna change the... Uh... So 
submit some different messages this time. So you can see the Scalades messages, they're not on the other side because the consumer is not running. But if I start it again, oops. Uh, you can see that it immediately started processing the messages again and got all the messages. Uh, so, to wrap up, uh, microservices have a lot of advantages. Um, there are trade-offs that you have to make with uh, the increasing chance of failure and increased complexity. Uh, asynchronous messaging can help reduce this complexity and Kafka is a really good option for, for doing this. Um, and finally, ACA streams and reactive Kafka make reliably processing data from Kafka with full back pressure in your actual services really simple. And so this might be what uh, an architecture of a system using ACA streams and Kafka might look like. You have services that are basically running uh, ACA streams inside, producing to Kafka, and then uh, consuming using ACA streams uh, in other services. And that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yes, you. So the question was whether Kafka can enforce any sequential message streams. Um, as I talked about earlier, um, Kafka only allows ordering within a given partition. And so if you are really, really care about ordering, you can create a topic that has one partition and you will get a total order within that topic. Every message you put in will be in the order that they, they arrive. Um, if you're a little uh, more, um, if you want to be able to have more partitions, uh, you give your messages a partition key. So say like a user ID or something, and then all messages for that user will always go to the same partition, so you can have an ordering at least in that part. Uh, more questions? Yeah, back there. Um, a thrift, I think, is a RPC format, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I haven't had a lot of experience with thrift. Um, you can use other things. Uh, I think another popular uh, format is Avro. Um, but basically anything that's binary is probably a better idea than using JSON, uh, just because it's smaller, takes up less space in the Kafka cluster, and is really fast to serialize and deserialize. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, back there. Yeah, it's, there's, uh, I think some of the methods take an implicit actor system um, that you're not seeing in the actual examples. And one of the nice things is that you don't actually have to deal with the actors, you just can write um, code that does flat maps, maps, group eyes, stuff like that on the streams, and uh, ACA handles creating all the actors and doing all the, the back pressure and stuff like that for you, which is really nice. Yeah? Um, I guess any way you would monitor other actors, ACA actually does create actors, um, and you can you can find them and find their names, and do whatever other kind of actor monitoring you would do. Um, I haven't actually done a lot of work with this yet. Um, I've just been playing around with it a lot, um, but I'm sure there are ways to monitor it. At least for Kafka itself, there are tools for monitoring the topics, and you can tell how many messages are being produced, how many are being consumed whether there's any consumers that are lagging behind and stuff like that, so that there's a lot of tooling around that that I've used a lot, and it works really well. Yeah? Um, yeah, I think ACA streams basically is good for in, inside a service. Um, you can have a stream that materializes to an actor, and so you could have the stream process send messages to that actor, and then that actor could send messages somewhere else in your cluster, and send it, say, to another actor that is in front of another stream. So you could you could do it that way. Um, yeah, you, you would have to deal with the back pressure yourself in that case, passing it over the cluster, I believe.
you, you, you could do that too. You could use Kafka in between the services to get that back pressure there, depending on whether uh, what your requirements are. Yeah, uh, Kafka 0.9 added a whole bunch of security features. So it added authentication and authorization. And so there are SSL certificates. It can use Kerberos to authenticate users. Um, it has ACLs, so you can say this user is only allowed to write to this topic or read from this topic. Um, you can do uh, quota-based limits on topics too, so it can only produce or consume so fast from the topics. 